so the next wave of homeworks is upon us. You know, you were, a lot of you are working on the homeworks to do this Friday. Well, the next ones are there if you want to take a look. If you want to start thinking about those ones, get them rattled around in your brains and uh, start coming up with some solutions. So for these, they're, again, just like the physics engine and rhyming dictionary, you have two choices. Do one of these assignments for the application objective. They are calculator and microwave, building the software to, uh, to control the functionality and the logic of these devices. A calculator, a four function calculator, and a microwave where you can set the uh, time to cook and also the power level of whatever you're going to cook with some extra functionality, a plus 30 second button, popcorn button, a few other uh, nice features. With these, the big thing with these assignments is that you can't use any, as I mentioned last time, you can't use any control flow. No conditionals, no loops, that means no if, uh, no switch statements, no uh, try catch, uh, no for loops, no while loops, none of that. Your code can't run conditionally at any time. So you can't say if some condition, run this code, else run this code. That logic can't be in there. There are ways to simulate this too uh, without using ifs explicitly, and all those things are banned. I'll look for those things in the submission. So no control flow, how do we build these without those fundamental basic programming tools that we usually have at our disposal? That's what we're gonna learn this week, uh, the rest of this week and next week. Sp specifically next week, we'll directly talk about the state pattern, which is the intended approach to be able to solve these homeworks. Right, before we get into content, anyone have questions about anything? do this polymorphism. So we have our, our third question in this series with electronics and batteries. This will be the last one. I won't hit you with another one of these. I'll have fresh ideas for, for the next ones. Um, but, uh, but let's add one more to cap this one off. If you don't have your functionality for Monday's lecture question, that is required for this one. So finish up Monday's lecture question. Make sure you get that submission in. Get your credit for that one before working on this one. It'll be a prere uh, prerequisite for this question. <coughs> so all that functionality from the last lecture question, battery, electronic, boombox, flashlight. Electronic is an abstract class. Flashlight and boombox extending, both extending that electronic class. And battery as it's been since, uh, since two lecture questions ago. What we'll want to add to this is an object named use electronic. Uh, use electronics with two methods. One, a method named use all that takes a list of electronics and calls use on each of them. And a method named swap batteries that takes two electronics and switches their batteries by reference. So the functionality, not too much here. I don't expect anyone to get tri too tripped up on the functionality itself. If you think of electronics as, uh, electronic as just a regular class, forget that it's an abstract class. Uh, this is just writing code, this is stuff that we've done, uh, we've done this already. Where this polymorphism that we'll talk about today comes into play is during the testing. So the testing is where you really start to use polymorphism. So how do we work with these methods, both use all and swap batteries? These methods take inputs of type electronic. Electronic is an abstract class. So we can't say new electronic. We can't create instances of an electronic directly so how do we test these methods when, we, uh, when they work with an abstract type? That's what we want to focus on for the testing. So for the testing, a flashlight and a boombox, these are electronics. So we're going to create flashlights and boomboxes to be able to test our code that works with electronics. So we're going to test those, that functionality of methods that work in abstract types by creating concrete uh, objects of the concrete types that extend that abstract class. And that's how we'll be able to, to test them. So most of the work here is going to be in the tests for this lecture question. Okay. Any questions about the question itself? Let's jump into some content. So we showed this image a few times, <coughs> and uh, now we can make a little more sense out of this one. So the Scala type hierarchy at the, the root is this class any, and absolutely every class in Scala, every object that you 
can ever create, ex uh, one way or another, extends this class any. So any, everything in Scala is of type any through its inheritance. From that, we have two different types. Any veil, these are going to be all of, all of the types that are going to be stored on the stack. So if we create, if anything extends any value, that value is going to end up on the stack. It's going to be in stack memory. And then any ref on the other side of this, uh, short for any reference, is going to be anything that's on the heap. And anything that's going to be passed by reference, this reference class is going to control that functionality of, of, of moving around the references, which refer to an object that's on the heap. This includes all of our classes. Any class that we write that doesn't explicitly extend the class implicitly extends any ref. So all of our stuff is all going on the heap. Recall from last lecture, we had this uh, subtype hierarchy. We have dynamic objects, which was extended by inanimate object, which was extended by ball and health potion. Dynamic object also extended game object. And then game object didn't explicitly extend anything, so it implicitly extended any ref. And then any ref extends any. So we have the, our own part of the type hierarchy in our own classes that we created last time. So that class that we created, for example, health potion, ends up having six different types through this type hierarchy. And any inherited type if we have an inherited type, we can store our objects in variables of that type. So we can, of course, do this first line, new health potion, and store it in a variable of type health potion. We'd expect that behavior. That behavior better be there. But we can also store a health potion, create a new health potion, and store it in a variable of type inanimate object, since a health potion is an inanimate object. It, Extended. It took an animate object as its starting point and extended that behavior. It is an inanimate object. Anything that's defined in an inanimate object is also defined in a health potion. So we can store this in a variable of type inanimate object. And this is where we start to see polymorphism. This is where we get polymorphism. This is what it is, is storing these types in variables of the classes that they extend. And throughout today's lecture, we're going to see some of the implications of this and some of the things that we can do that leverage this fact that we can store these values in variables of different types. So also, health potion, inanimate object, extends dynamic object. So we can create health potions and store them in variables of type dynamic object, and so on, game object, any ref, and all the way down to any. We can always have variables of type any and store absolutely anything in that variable. This is where we get the word polymorphism from. Poly means many, morph means forms. So we have many forms. A health potion can take on six different forms based on six different types that it inherently is. So health potion, masquerading as a dynamic object. So polymorphism, whenever we have those values in variables of different types, we're taking advantage of that polymorphism, the, the fact that a polymorphism has six different types inside of it as a polymorphism is. Now, what are the implications of this, and why do we do it? So polymorphism, when we store these, um, val these objects in variables of certain types, uh, we have certain functionality based on the type of the variable itself. So if you recall, in the inanimate object class, we define this magnitude of momentum method that would compute the momentum when we created the health potion class, we extended an animate object, so we inherited that magnitude of momentum method. And in the health potion class, we have access to that method. So we can do potion one of type health potion and access magnitude of momentum, because it's defined in health potion, health potion, grab that behavior, and it is part of that class. When we store a health potion and type an animate object, Inanimate object also has a magnitude of momentum class uh, uh, method, so we can also call it there. But once we get down to dynamic object, a dynamic object doesn't know anything about the magnitude of momentum method. So when we store this in potion three of type dynamic object, we no longer have access to magnitude of momentum. Now the health potion object that 
that we created does have a magnitude of momentum method. It's still there, it still exists, and it's fully functional still, but once we store it in a variable of type dynamic object, game object, any ref, or any, since it's stored in a variable of a type that doesn't know what magnitude of momentum is, we're not allowed to call that method anymore. We can only call that method if we're currently storing the object in a variable that knows about that method. So why would we ever do this? We have polymorphism, we can store values in uh, variables of different types uh, uh, in its type of hierarchy, but all we did was lose functionality. So if all we're doing is losing functionality and restricting access to methods that we know exist and to variables that we know exist, but we can't access them because we're not stored in the right type of variable, why would we ever do this? It uh, seems like a silly thing to do on the surface, but we're gonna see a lot of ways that we can take advantage of this to really help us structure our programs. So recall when we saw the, when we wrote the player class, we had these two methods, use ball that takes a ball and use health potion that takes a health potion. The definitions of these methods are effectively identical, just the variable names are different here, but we have the same functionality in two different methods because we have two different types that can be used by the player. Now we can do this, we can get away with this, just like the last lecture, yeah, this, is, this works, this is fine, it's okay. But once we start adding more types, more objects that the players can interact with, we're going to have to edit this player class every single time. We're going to, have to add a new method for the player using that specific object. It's going to have the same functionality. It's just going to defer to that item to get that specific behavior of that item of what happens. Um, but we'll have to add a new method every time we add a new object. So we might have 10, 15, 20. We might have a lot of different methods in this player class for every single type of object that it can interact with in the game. Uh, this can get painful as your game gets large, as you start expanding features. Very painful to do. So let's do something a little better. We're going to take advantage of our newly found ability of using polymorphism. We're going to take that player class with the two methods, combine those to one method, and take an inanimate object as the parameter instead of either a ball or a health potion as the parameter. Now we take an inanimate object. An inanimate object has this use method. We're going to use it on this, have that definition that we had uh, in the, the original class, but have it at, applied at the inanimate object level. Now when we did this, uh, created this inanimate object and uh, it should be extending, I should be extending dynamic object here. This is an old version of this uh, class. Uh, but you might have been wondering when we created this, why do we have these abstract <coughs> methods? This seems silly, it seems pointless when we have uh, defined this use method, but don't give it a definition. We declare it, but don't give it a definition. So we have this use method. We didn't do anything with it. We didn't define it. And then in our ball and health potion classes, we defined this method and had to retype all of this anyway. The only difference is we created a ball and health potion. The only difference is we had to use the word override because we had an abstract method. So why did we do all that? Why didn't we just not type override, delete this from the inanimate object class, and just have less overall code? Why are we adding these abstract methods with no definitions and then implementing them in the inheriting classes? And this is exactly why. It's so we can call the use method from a variable of type inanimate object. So if we only implemented use in the extending classes without having that abstract method in the abstract class, we would not be able to do this. We would not be able to call use here because use would only exist in the ball and health potion classes. It wouldn't exist in the inanimate object class. So once I have a variable in of type inanimate object, inanimate object doesn't know about the use method, I would be restricted from accessing it, wouldn't be able to, uh, wouldn't be able to set up my method this way. If we have an abstract method, what we're saying is anything that extends this, it either has to be abstract or it has to implement this method. So this is a contract, this is a guarantee that if I have 
of, of value, if I have a reference of type inanimate object, I don't, I don't know anything about its use method, but I do know that it exists. It has to exist because we can't instantiate, we can't say new some abstract class, we can't say new inanimate object. If we have a reference to an object that's on the heap, if that was allocated in memory and created and everything, then I know it's not an abstract type. So it must have at some point implemented this use method. I have no idea what it does. I have no idea what the actual functionality is. When this method is called, it's either, it can be called on a health potion or a bow, which have two drastically different use methods. But I don't care what it does. I just need to I need that guarantee that it exists. And that's what the abstract method is doing for me. If I have a reference of type inanimate object, it will have a use method that takes a player and returns unit. And it has to. Or else, uh, if you try to somehow finagle it so there isn't that method, somewhere along the line, you would have gotten a compiler error. Compiler would have said, hey, you're, you need to implement that method because you set up this contract that said, hey, that will exist. It will be implemented by some concrete class somewhere down the road, some class that's not abstract. So I can use that fact, call that use method, and I know it will exist. Don't know what it does, but it has to exist. So now I can use, call this use item method on my two types. I'm gonna store these values in their respective types, in variables of their respective types. But then once I call the use item method, I have this implicit assignment operator when I call the method. Uh, when use item is called, we're going to create a new stack frame. We're going to create a variable named item of type inanimate object and assign it the value of the argument that was called. So I have item of type inanimate object equals potion, which is of type health potion, which is this health potion that was created here. And this is just like the assignments that we saw in the first few slides. When we created a new health potion and stored it in a variable of type inanimate object, the same thing is happening here. I'm just doing it across a method call. So I'm assigning this variable to that value. Perfectly valid, I can give this method an input of type ball or health potion, and polymorphism takes care of me after that. It says, yeah, the health potion is an inanimate object according to the type hierarchy. So this is legit. Compiler doesn't complain. Method is called. Everything works. Uh, works as we want it to be working. And now with our setup like this, we don't have to modify the player class at all as we add new game objects. Before, the, we went, the way we had it set up, we'd have a new method in the player class each time we add a new object to the game. None of that anymore. As long as that object extends an animate object, that object can implement whatever functionality it needs when it's used, and the player class, the player can use that objects of that type. It can have items of that type um, and just uh, and use them. It could create an inventory and, and, uh, and think features like that that we don't have here. Uh, but the, one of the huge benefits of this is once we write the player class, we're done with this class. Unless we want to expand the player itself, so maybe we want to add a dexterity attribute to the player and have that make some changes uh, to various, uh, various aspects of the game. If we don't want to change the player fundamentally, we don't want to be editing this class at all. So what we'd like to do is write this class once, test it, write all our unit tests, satisfy our QA engineers, have them happy with it, uh, convinced that it's not going to cause bugs in our finished product that we release, we want to have this class solid and then not touch it again unless we're fundamentally changing the player. We don't want to be touching this class every time we create a new object type that the player is going to interact with. That doesn't fundamentally change a player. It just changes that object that we created. So we'll create that new object, test that new object, and then not touch that object again. But we don't want to revisit this player class, add a new method. Now we've got to write more tests for that method. We've got to satisfy our QA engineers again. We gotta go through a lot of process to make sure that we didn't break any functionality when we change this class that we really ought to not be changing very often. Uh, this makes it a lot easier to be able to, uh, to expand the game without having these rippling effects. If I add a new object, I gotta change my player class. Now I gotta change my backpack uh, item because now the inventory, it can, I can have an add, 
add bow and arrow to my inventory, I gotta add that method. You don't want those rippling effects that you have to change your entire code base just to make one little change, add one new feature to your game. Just have this work with the abstract types. If everything's working with abstract types, you can add new concrete types without really changing much else in your code. You can add, expand functionality simply. We want to be able to do that very effectively, efficiently, and we can do that with polymorphism. Any questions to this point? So we haven't. So we haven't implemented the an inventory yet. We could do that. We certainly can. But recall that when we did, when we wrote the ball and health potion classes, we had different behavior of the use methods. So in the ball class, we set its velocity equal to wherever the player's facing. Uh, and then factored in their strength to figure out how far this ball is going to be thrown. And with the health potion class, use is going to replenish the user's health uh, up to their max health, depending on the volume of the potion up to their max health. So these use methods have wildly different behavior depending on what type it actually was. We actually don't care about that behavior. Uh, but the behavior is changing. I mean, we care about that behavior. But in this method, when we're writing this use item method, we don't actually care what that behavior is. We just care that it exists, that that method exists. And then we'll call that method very different behavior. And that behavior depends on the actual type of this item. So I don't have access from here uh, to any of the ball or health potion specific functionality. But when I call use, the definition of use depends on what type this actually is, whether it's a ball or a health potion. And that, that method has very different behavior based on the type of the input, even though I don't know what that type is necessarily. There are ways to, to find it out, but we don't have a direct, uh, we never check what the type that this is, but that use method has different behavior based on that type. That's uh, at a very high level, that's how we're gonna make the decisions in our calculator and microwave, is based on the type of a variable. It's going to just have different behavior, and then we can change the type of the variables. We'll have a state variable that stores uh, an abstract of an abstract type, and then set that equal to a new object as certain events happen in our code. We'll change that object to a new object, and then that object is going to change all of the behavior of our program because it's a different type. It overrode those abstract methods with different functionality. So we can change the whole functionality of our program by swapping out a state variable with a different object with different functionality implemented, but with the same uh, imp, uh, type being extended. We'll talk about that at length all next week. Uh, but that's the high level overview of how we're gonna swap out that functionality based on types. This, this method does different things based on the type. Same idea, we're gonna keep expanding upon that. Any other questions? So last time we took the uh, inanimate object class and we extended dynamic object to be able to get, uh, to be able to have physics applied to our balls in health potions. But we can do the same thing with the player class too. We want our players to be able to react to to physics, we want gravity applied to them, we want velocity, we want them to be able to jump around and do fun things in this game, we want them to interact with the world and move around it. So we're going to extend the dynamic object from the player class as well, forward that location and dimension to the dynamic object, set the velocity equal to whatever we got in the player's constructor, make sure those are two different names so we can uh, assign those variables, we can make that assignment without having a name conflict. And now, Physics is applied to our player, can be applied to our player. So now with polymorphism, we can also have different types in our data structures. So if I have, I want a list of dynamic objects for my physics engine, I can give it a list that mixes potions 
involves players that I not add the players to this list. I actually did. Well, the player is supposed to be in that list. <laughs> I turned the third lecture and I just noticed that. Uh, we can add all three of these types all in one list of type dynamic object, give that to our game world, and now physics is applied to all those. We call update world, and all of those objects move around and collide and have gravity applied to them in the way that's defined in our physics engine. And if you're not, uh, even if you're not working on the physics engine homework, I recommend you look through uh, the, the code provided for that. There's a lot of code provided in the physics engine, that whole jumper game, that isn't, no, that I don't expect you, at the time of doing that homework, I don't expect you to understand uh, really any of that code that's provided. And you don't have to, you just work on the physics engine itself and the objectives in that. You don't have to navigate outside of that code at all. Um, with a few exceptions, actually I gotta backtrack a little bit. With a few exceptions, you should understand the physics vector, the, the uh, dynamic object, how it sets those values when the, the methods are called. Um, but outside of those ones, I don't expect you to uh, Uh, about the like the jump mechanics in the game uh, are fairly complex. There's a whole there's I want to say like ten classes set up uh, to be able to handle the jump mechanics of that. And the jump mechanics are fairly complex. For example, if you hold down the button longer when you jump, you're going to jump higher. If you just tap the button, you'll have to do just a, a smaller jump. If you're moving while you jump, you're going to jump higher. There's also a double jump. Uh, and all of this functionality is implemented using the state pattern that we're going to talk about next week. And some of the things we'll talk about today, we'll revisit this towards the end of lecture. Uh, some, of the implement, some of the behavior of the game is implemented using topics that we're learning, that we're talking about today. So even if you're not working on that, if you, you chose Ryman Dictionary, I recommend you look through the code because I'm going to start referencing that in lecture whenever we can explain and understand more of that code that was provided. By the end of the semester, you'll be able to understand everything that's going on in that physics engine homework in that jumper game. You'll be able to understand all that code, even though you can't understand it when we first started that assignment. Uh, so I recommend going through that. So here's one, one case where, where we can use that. Our physics engine only works with these dynamic objects and static objects. So while that's pretty boring, we just have two object types and they're super generic and have no functionality, that's really boring. But we just extend dynamic object, add all the functionality to our actual game, and then throw all those in a list of dynamic objects, give it to our game world, and now everything you wrote in physics engine applies to this game. It actually gets this game to run. Okay, let's take a talk about a slightly different topic for a little bit, override. We saw this last time, it's more of an inheritance topic. Uh, but let's talk about what's going on with these overrides a little bit more. So with uh, in Scala, everything extends uh, extends any, the any class, and all of the objects, all the classes we write will extend any ref at some point. Maybe we'll extend something else that extends any ref. It will extend something else that extends something else that extends something else that extends any ref. But at some point, everything we write, every class we write, does extend any ref which extends any. Uh, so we get some methods and some functionality from these classes, just like we, we inherited magnitude of momentum from our inanimate object, we are inheriting some functionality from these classes. So a few of those methods I want to talk about. ToString is part of the any class. So absolutely every object in Scala can be converted to a string. So if we do print, uh, print line, Literally any object, it's going to convert it to a string and print out the string, uh, that string. You're never going to get an error, no two string method in this object. Everything can be converted to a string because it's declared in the any class and everything extends any. Same with dot equals. Everything has, oh, and the default, if we don't do anything, the default behavior of two string is going to be object type at some reference, some uh, some hash value representing a reference. So we're gonna get the fully qualified name that includes the, pa the package name and the class name at and then some number representing 
uh, how to find this thing in memory. There's also the equals method, which is called, in, uh, when we call the equal equal method, it will call that equals. This is going to compare the references of two objects. We saw this throughout the last few lecture questions. Equal equal on a class that you wrote, on two objects created from a class that you wrote of that type, equal equal is going to compare the references. Are these referring to the same exact object on the heap? So if we look at this code, when we print these things out, we just get something representing the reference and also the name of the class. And then we have two health potions here stored in three different variables. This assignment is by reference. So potion three and potion one refer to the same health potion. When we say potion one equals potion two, well, these refer to different health potions. We can see that the references are different from the two string. So that's going to return false. These are different health potions. Yeah, they have all the same values in their state variables, but they don't refer to the same health potion, not the same health potion. Potion one and potion three, this assignment was by reference. These both refer to this health potion, and we can see from the two string that these methods, uh, that these variables do refer to the same exact health potion. So equal equal, that dot equals, it's gonna return true there. But what if we don't want this behavior? That's where we can override. Just like we did override when we created an electronic class that had a use method and we overwrote it in, uh, in Flashlight and Boombox, it was, there was no definition yet, but if there were, we would be overriding that functionality. Just like we did that, we can do the same thing here. We can override the toString method and implement any method that returns a string, and that's the new behavior when two string is called or when we print these things to the screen, this is what's going to happen. So uh, we did this with physics vector. We want physics vectors. I mean, we don't want physics.physicsvector at some random garbage. That doesn't help us too much. <coughs> what we do want is uh, a physics vector displayed in the way that we expect x comma y comma z in parentheses. Once it's printed in that way, it makes more sense to us than the class name and some reference. We can do the same thing with health potion, just printing some of the values, print the values of its state variables to the screen, just give us some more, uh, more useful information when we convert these things to strings. And of note, there's no parentheses here. This is syntax that Scala allows. You can leave off the parentheses. I don't really recommend it. I, I like to make it clear that these are methods that have no parameters, but when there's no parameter list, you can leave it off. The two string method leaves these parentheses off, so when we override it, we also have to leave those off. Just, uh, just the way it is, we have to live with it. We can also override that equals method, so if we don't want to compare two objects by reference, which is almost never what we want to do. And we did it in the lecture questions, but that's just to uh, help understand references. Uh, it's usually not the behavior we want. We want to find some way of saying that two things are effectively equal according to whatever definition we decide. So for health potions, I want to say they're equal if they have the same volume. They're effectively equal to the player. They're both going to restore the same amount of health. So I'll say they're equal at that point, and we can implement that functionality. When we override the equals method, the equals method actually takes a value of type any and returns Boolean, whether it's uh, the same or not. But we have this value of type any, so this could be literally any type in Scala. We don't know what type it is, so we want to do some type checking when we get this thing. So we only have, at the input from o this obj, this object variable, we only have access to the methods defined in the any class, which isn't much, it's not going to be helpful to us. But we can use this nifty thing that Scala gives us, the match case statement. We're going to match this object against certain, uh, certain conditions. And if one of these is true, we're going to execute this code conditionally. So what I'm saying here is if object is of type health potion, store it in a variable named HP of type health potion and run this code, which is going to be comparing the volumes. So if this is being compared with another health potion and their volumes are the same, return true, these are effectively equal. Uh, this, this syntax here, I could put a whole body of code here. I can put an open brace and then a closed brace and multiple lines and put any block of code here. I 
put it on one line. The syntax kind of allows us to do. I uh, put it on one line just because it takes up less room in the slide. Uh, with the braces, I'd have to use two more lines, so no reason for that. Uh, necessarily, if you want to take up more space, if you want more functionality, if you've got a lot of checks to do to make to see if two things are equal, you can use multiple lines there. And then the uh, the wild card the underscore in Scala is a, a wild card saying, uh, okay, if this is a health potion, do this. And then I'm basically saying else, if this is any other type ever, just return false. I don't want to compare a health potion to something that's not a health potion. It doesn't make sense in my context here. I just want to say, are these two health potions that have the same volume? Anything else will just return false. So now our code, the same code, since we've changed the health potion class, the same code has wildly different behavior. So now when we print these things out, we actually get some useful information that we might be interested in. And when we compare these, when we call it equal equal, that's going to compare them by volume. If they have the same volume, return true. Potion one and two refer to, the, to different health potions, but they both have volume four, true. One and three, they refer to the same health potion, so of course their volumes will be equal, true. So we can change this behavior at our will, depending on what behavior we want from these methods, if we want to override that default behavior. Uh, notably though, we do lose the ability here. Uh, we could still do it, but we'd have to do some extra work. We lose the ability to conveniently check if these two variables refer to the same object. Uh, so uh, if that is something you want to do, which like I mentioned, isn't really something you want to do very often, um, you would have to do some extra work to do that. Usually you want some more logical uh, meaning for equal equal, not are these literally the same thing. So we have different behavior now. Let's talk. Uh, so let's jump back. Any questions on that part? On overrides? So let's uh, let's go back to to the jumper code and talk about some more features that we built using that override functionality in this class. So. Uh, so we have some inheritance here. We have platforms in our jumper game that we want to behave like a platform. We want it to be able to land on these platforms. Uh, but we don't not inherently have that functionality from the physics engine. So the platform is going to extend this jumper object, which is uh, an inter intermediate object that I created. Just because I needed unique IDs for each object, I needed that to display them on the GUI. As the screen scrolls up, I need to track each object that's currently visible. Uh, so I needed an ID that was just part of my solution for that. So I have this intermediate class, which ends up extending static object. So by transitivity, platform is a static object. It is that type. So it can work with our physics engine. I can put it in the static objects list in my game world. And it can behave like a static object. And one of the things static objects do is when, in that objective three, when a dynamic object collides with it, this method is going to be called with the dynamic object that hit this and also the face that it hit. So we have six sides. These are all rectangular prisms. For those of you who are doing a rhyming dictionary and haven't looked at this, again, I recommend you look through this, this code. Uh, there's a lot of good examples of, of what we're talking about in class in there. Um, if I hit the top, the bottom, uh, the either the four, any of the four sides, or an internal collision, if I'm already colliding and moving through this thing, uh, the face is going to tell us which face uh, has of this rectangular prism we're colliding with. So the collide with dynamic object method in the physics engine homework doesn't really do anything. It, in, the dynamic, uh, oh, in the dynamic object class, no, in this, the, geez, where am I? It's in the game object class which isn't shown here. Static object extends game object. But in the game object class, collide with dynamic object doesn't really do anything. All it does is set a Boolean value to true that said I, I collided with something. And it remembers other object. It stores that in a state variable to know uh, who it collided with. And then it remembers the face. It stores that in a variable to remember the face. And we do that just for testing purposes. So in our unit tests, when things are supposed to collide, we're going to access those state variables to check if it this is just testing behavior. It's a testing implementation. 
of this method. But when we actually want to build our games, we don't want that testing functionality. We want our game logic functionality. So we're going to override that flag with the dynamic object method, get rid of that testing functionality that sets those state variables that we use for testing, and replace it with actual game logic. Here I want to say if I collided, if this dynamic object collided with my top face, land on the platform. So I want to set their velocity in the z direction to zero, and I don't want to let them clip through the platform, so if they collided and they're now overlapping with the platform a little bit, Let's just move their Z location to be right on top of the platform. So let's let them land on the platform. But only when the collision is with the top face. If this player jumps up from underneath the platform and hit, collides with the bottom, don't do anything. And then on that next frame, we're going to have what's called an internal collision. We're moving through the platform. Don't do anything. If it hits the sides, don't do anything. Only if you hit the top of the platform, we want to react to that. Now importantly, our physics engine doesn't know anything about platforms, but when it called this collide with dynamic object method, it gets to call this implementation of that method without even knowing it. So our, we don't have to update anything with physics engine to add this functionality. We just extend static object and override the methods with our own functionality. So with the physics engine, uh, what's defined in the homework spec, you build that functionality, you test that functionality, and your physics engine is done. You don't touch that code anymore. You have your physics, unless you want to add new physics features, maybe you want to add dynamic collisions if you didn't do the, the expansion part of the design. The physics engine's done. And then whenever you want to build a game that uses that physics engine, you extend the static object and dynamic object classes, and now, those objects can interact according to that physics without that physics engine having to know anything about the details of your game. You just use that code completely independently. That means when you're adding new functionality to your game, like collision with platforms, you're never going to your physics engine and forced to make changes there. You wrote that once, you tested it once, it's done. That code works, and your hands off of the physics engine. Now you just use the physics engine after that. And with confidence that it works. Uh, we do the same thing with walls, except we're concerned with the negative x and positive x collisions. If we hit a wall on the sides, we want to be able to we want to stop the player moving in that direction and also make sure they didn't clip. So we want to move back them up a little bit. If between the frame updates, they're going to move through that wall a little bit. We just want to back them up, make sure we're not clipping through uh, clipping through the wall. 